Welcome one, welcome all to episode 182 of the Xbox Expansion Pass recorded on Saturday, June 17th, 2023. I am your host, Luke Lore, the Insipid Ghost, joined by my co-host, the Intrepid, Captain Logan. And in this episode, we find ourselves catching a breath after several incredible showcases from Xbox to Ubisoft and Summer Game Fest. Xbox has, Xbox has put up some impressive streaming numbers in there, and it seems as though they partnered with People Can Fly for a mystery Xbox project. All that and more, as always, we hope that you enjoy the show. Logan? We like to start the show by offering words of kindness to those who have made our gaming weeks better. But first, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good. Uh, we got to do some IT troubleshooting this morning before recording, and that's we, always the best. We did. You did. You crushed it. <laughs> you came up with a solution that I was like, I would never have thought of that. So bravo to you. Thank you. I uh, I, I am having a pretty good week. It's going to be, uh, it's the start of the last week before I start going on vacations mm -hmm. for Sea of Thieves. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, um, I'm realizing like my normal routine is about to get extremely disrupted. So yeah. I won't be here for the next episode, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of a bummer. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to at least getting to, to sit down and chat with you at least one time before I start going globe globe trotting yeah. around the world well-earned vacation my friend i'm excited for <laughs> you your community uh certainly after the new mystery was announced and the new expansion it's like yo let's go uh yeah. good news good news for you man that's awesome uh, as for next week's show i'm not sure if i'm gonna take a break or bring in a co-host because i'm mm. i'm exhausted after those incredible showcases we did a lot of content which if you guys missed go back and check it out um yeah. and uh, also like, you know, after school coming in, like I'm, I'm a little burnt and I've got several interviews that I'm going to be working on. So it's not like XCP would be on pause, just the show proper for a week. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. I haven't decided yet. Uh, but you know, I'm glad that you're getting to take some vacation time and, and hang out yeah. with the community. That's so cool, dude. Well, you, you're on like a whole vacation for summer, aren't you? I am in a weird crossroads right now because I've just kind of slowed down. I'm not sure if I want to look for jobs this summer and do something different because I don't like the way a couple things in education are going, but that's been the case for a while. And mm -hmm. so it's like a thing I toy with, you know, like, I'm not sure I'm at a strange kind of conundrum. So I'm, I need to catch my breath. I think I'm at that burnout of life where I just need mm -hmm. a break. Um, yeah. And thankfully uh, I'm very fortunate in that I can take a break because I do have summer. So there is that I recognize the privilege in being able to consider that. So we'll see, man, we'll see. But uh, very yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, words of kindness, my friend. I want to start this week and I want to give a shout out to Clint Coombs. Uh, he's one of our Patreon members, uh, an amazing dude. Uh, Clint not only helped me you know, put together a few news topics for this week, which we'll talk about. Um, he is the meme master extraordinaire for our discord. And <laughs> the what is it? The extraordinary fan or, or extra extravagant fan from Fallout or something? We'll, we'll call him that. Yeah. We'll yeah. call him the, the extravagant fan. <laughs> he bears a, a striking resemblance to me. And Clint managed to do some side by side memes and whatnot. And uh, as much as I I joke about not liking the Fallout boy jokes and, and the double downs and such, it's always cool when your community rallies and is fun with you. Clint mm -hmm. made my week. So I was like, all right, Clint's getting that shout out. I love it. And <laughs> incredible supporter of XCP in all the ways, retweets, engagement, everything. So I, I'm grateful to him. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's so funny because mine, mine tangentially relates to that because uh -oh. uh, I because th that's that means we've been going around a little bit. And uh, so I saw Miles uh, Dompierre um, post like a, a like a thumbnail for <laughs> an upcoming show or some news that he was doing mm -hmm. and he had that character <laughs> in there as well and he doesn't know that people relate it to me does he <laughs> i don't think he does yeah. so if he did i was like oh thanks for putting luke in there <laughs> it's like no problem so shout out to miles for for uh for not knowing that like the history that we've had about that but <laughs> making my day for that mm -hmm. and um kyle stevenson from uh, uh, play, uh ps trophy room mr k-step Okay. Uh, he is taking some time off from social media, um, which I thought was uh, a really good way 
to just kind of have like a good mental break, like mm-hmm. a good reminder to take care of yourself, step away from social media if you need to, mm-hmm. uh, and, and disengage, um, with, with a lot of it. If, if it's, if it's, it's not feeding you positivity, mm-hmm. then restrict it from what, what it has access to, you know, like, don't, don't let things like that mm-hmm. bear down on you because it's, it's, there's, it's not worth it. There's so many other things you could be doing that are, that are positive influences in your life. Mm-hmm. Feeding yourself negativity um is is not one of those things that deserves to be there so shout out to him for for taking the conscious effort to step away from from that uh when it starts to get too much yeah and i think uh especially given how much content so many people put out during Mm -hmm. what is a e3 week i don't know whatever you want to call it um there's a lot that's a lot of work and if you're if you're a hobbyist like like we are uh or an enthusiast creator or whatever you want to call like our branch of content creation um it can be tiring especially if you're doing it next to a job next to life next to family Mm -hmm. taking care of family whatever it is um and those those step steps back are important and i i i sometimes over push patreon i don't mean to i think i'm just trying to learn and find my grounds there but last night i tweeted out just like hey support the content creators that, that make stuff you like because this the past few weeks were a touch grueling and touch difficult. Um, and I was thinking literally about trophy room. Like they put out a ton of stuff thinking about console creatures, yeah. a lot of stuff. Um, and if you, if you as a consumer, anyone listening is a regular listener of, of uh, another show and I'm not specifically talking about ours, but like just a show in general, find a way to thank them, a retweet, a like, tell them, you know, those things matter. Those things matter more than the financial stuff, at least to me. In, so, you know what sense? I've, yeah and and to kind of piggyback off of that the thing that i've always loved about making content Mm -hmm. um i i think i value like when i get an email in from someone um i don't know what it is about getting like an email from someone it's almost like the thought of them sitting down and like penning out an actual letter given how easy it is to reach people nowadays and just quick like dms and stuff Mm -hmm. but getting an actual like email from someone holds so much enthusiasm and, and weight in my mind like i'm so excited to to get an email from a fan uh that i'm just like oh my god like they yeah they took the time to write an email which you know back in the day that would it would have been like oh my god they're being so easy about this so i couldn't even write a, a proper letter then mail it out or anything like that it's like <laughs> nowadays the, the the bar has shifted to if i'm not even it, it's not even the the monetary aspect of it but letters i think when people send me little gifts, things like that, that all of that stuff, I think weighs so much more than just like, Hey, support the content. Cause we have, we have bills kind of stuff like that. Right. I, I, I think I, I, I know where you're coming from. Cause I think I really appreciate when folks just reach out to say they like the content, even Agreed. if it's just like a YouTube comment. I love that stuff. It 100%. makes me feel, feel like it's so worth it to kind of like take the time aside to put together the show notes, trouble, tr- it troubleshoot <laughs> random yeah. issues with Zencaster. <laughs> Yeah, it was, you're Stuff right, like man. That. I still think about Red Beast. He sent me a note a couple months back. I still think about like that, knowing that he listens with his family in his car, right? Like, yeah, seeing, I love seeing, those. Yeah, like that. That matters more. And and I, I like it's hindsight twenty twenty. Like I feel bad about how like I've I keep talking about Patreon or I keep talking about this thing or asking for this. I am just finding my way. And people that send notes or engage on Discord or on Twitter and stuff. They let me know it's okay. Like Todd Oxter, man, I can count on him and Edward Varnell to always be, be supportive, you know, and good advice. Yeah. And I, 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 that matters more, I guess is kind of, kind of the kicker here. Well, let's read our Patreon shout outs and then move on. Uh, yeah. I think it's my week to read them, which it I, is. I, yep. So thank you guys. Uh, anybody that's taking the time to support XCP over on Patreon tier two and three. These are our shout outs for this week. <clears throat> Robbie Bobby Miller, Silent Cypher. Xbox Skittle, African, aka Charles Jones, Game Positive, Zach LeCoulter, Jam Pack Sam, Matt Valdez, Neo Prime 33, Rick Davis, Red Beast, Xbox Mike 29, Matt Without Fear, The Lord Sir Master James Suddy, Brendan Myers, aka The Winter Gamer, Sony's VP of Marketing Kevin Butler, Clint Coombs, DJ Hero, and Dano12. Thanks, guys. You guys are amazing. We appreciate you. Definitely. So, all right, man. Whew. Logan, we had, 
like just a, a nonstop news weeks the past few episodes uh, between the PlayStation showcase, which which exhibited quite a bit of third party. Then we had Summer Game Fest. Then we had the Xbox showcase. Uh, we didn't get to record after the Ubisoft Ford, which was incredible. Capcom yeah. showcase, Xbox showcase extended. It has been a doozy. And uh, I got to tell you, I, I want to start first with the Ubisoft Ford, if you don't mind. That's a little bit further down in our notes. Please. Um, Can we? <laughs> yeah. The Ubisoft are it's as good as all those showcases were. And I think the Xbox showcase was perhaps the best showcase in terms of yeah. getting me excited for new things, reinvigorating an audience. Uh, I mean, we saw tons of stuff from Xbox from third party to first party, new IP, um, a lot to celebrate there. Ubisoft Ford, uh, this was a, a really cool thing for me because while Xbox showed me stuff that I'm excited about, that was a surprise. Ubisoft showed me stuff that is within my interest level. Like Xbox sold me on Starfield. Xbox got me interested in Clockwork Revolution and Avowed in ways that I wasn't. But Ubisoft Forward showed me something that I'm interested in, which is Avatar. Interested in, which is Star Wars. Uh, they brought me around real quick on on uh, Prince of Persia. The Ubisoft Forward was wonderful. I thought. Yeah, it was like legit. The it it was a very traditional showcase for like an E3. And as, as much as they had like some pretty cheesy stuff, there was some like, okay, guys, <laughs> you, you got the people talking. You're right. Let's, yeah. Let's get some enthusiasm in there. You know, like, I'm glad we're all making games and whatnot, but let's get some people with some personalities to jump in or just cut the, cut the people out in, in general. Mm -hmm. Two takeaways I got from that Ubisoft forward, uh, or actually let's, I'll make it three. My three okay. takeaways from the Ubisoft forward. Number one, it was short. Yeah. Number two, Lots of gameplay, actual mm -hmm. gameplay. Number three, lots of solid dates. Like mm -hmm. those are the three things that I think I was hoping for more from Xbox showcase. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think I actually liked Ubisoft's showcase just a, just a hair more than Xbox's because even though we got a, a tremendous amount of content with Xboxes, dude, the Ubisoft forward came hard mm -hmm. and they did not stop until the very end. It was insane. I was like, damn, all of those games are all really, really cool. Like mm -hmm. they're all Ubisoft games, but they're not they're not like the stand. Like I didn't see Far Cry. I didn't see Watch Dogs. I saw like mm -hmm. new stuff and new stuff that was like actually really interesting. It's weird because Xbox kind of did this something similar you didn't see halo you didn't see gears they did new stuff um and then for us to see the ubisoft forward have uh the star wars which which xbox showed and then we see more gameplay at ubisoft forward fantastic that game looks really good that looks to be the if jedi survivor is the perfect jedi game this looks like it's going to be the perfect non-jedi game uh um, yeah and i and i'm so excited for that one uh Avatar to me is is I love Avatar. I didn't like Way of Water very much compared to the first, but I still love the universe. Eh, it was dumb. It was like how many trillions of dollars mm. are they spending for revenge? That was stupid. Mm. Um, yeah, right. But I still love Avatar in that world. And this looks to be Far Cry meets Avatar, which I'm there for. Uh, Assassin's Creed Mirage looks like a return to form to play the old Assassin's Creed with kind of yeah. the modern amenities i guess that we would have the modern luxuries and so i'm excited for that um and then prince of persia they sold me once again they reminded us that 2d platforming uh action is really dope uh if anybody's in doubt about that consider like metroid dread consider ori uh there's a lot of games that, that get a lot of spotlight in that realm as they should um so i'm there for that as well and then the new crude game looks like forza horizon which if you yeah. like Forza Horizon and maybe Motorsport's not your jam, you got the new crew title, which is going to be great. Uh, and you can carry over your old cars, which was cool to me. Despite the old school presentation of the Ubisoft Ford, they gave me four games. I emailed my UB, UB rep the other day. I was like, OK, Assassin's Creed, Avatar, Star Wars, Prince of Persia. Um, that's four games that I'm like, hey, I want to cover. That's yeah. crazy good. Um, yeah and it remind. it's like i'm sorry i keep going on but i mean no, no, like, no. it's cool to see capcom hitting their groove the past few years ubisoft seems to be returning to their groove because they had it for a, a good bit um i love when the third parties just deliver 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic. I I can't wait to play Far Cry in the Avatar world. I think it mm-hmm. looks fantastic. I loved Way of the Water. I thought it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um Star Wars beautiful. Outlaws is the I, I I'm trying to think of like I, I can't remember what I equated it to. Um, but there was it, it's just it was just absolutely beautiful it's like the next outer worlds but with like little a cute little companion and i think they're going to do a great job with that one prince of persia feels like metroid dread i absolutely love it i think it looks amazing i think it's probably going to be a little too technical for what i can do Mm -hmm. um assassin's creed mirage is is great the crew coming out of nowhere to to supply uh what would most like like if you're not an xbox fan you're not going to be playing for uh, forza horizon 5 um but knowing that the crew has a game that will feel like that for playstation users is a huge win for them because mm-hmm. horizon is a fantastic series so i'm so excited about that the one that i i wanted to bring up uh which is kind of a bummer is assassin's creed nexus um that is a vr assassin's creed game where you're hopping around between some of the biggest like assassin's creed protagonists in the franchise and like doing assassin's creed stuff but in vr and i'm so bummed that it's locked to uh the oculus 3 uh Mm -hmm. or the meta 3 whatever they whatever you want to call it um because or not the three but just in general the oculus meta vr ecosystem is is getting that uh because as someone who has a PSVR 2 in the anticipation of getting first party content for my PSVR, uh, I've, I've only had Horizon uh, uh, Call of the Mountain so far. I'm still waiting for like God of War or Spider-Man or, or, or some other first party entity to, to show up on that device. Uh, and, and knowing that Ubisoft is really good at supporting third party uh, as a third party publisher. Big time. It's, that is it's a great so, strength of theirs. Yeah, it's it's such a bummer to see that that they aren't going to be able to port this over to PSVR two, and I and I get it. It is a niche niche market right now. Uh, the the install base for Oculus is huge in comparison, so I don't blame them. Uh, I'm just hoping that eventually Sony will do something to incentivize people to pick up this headset so that I can actually get some of the really good games. Because otherwise, I might just sell the damn thing and pick up a, a an Oculus at this mm-hmm. point. I was uh, surprised by the lack of VR across the board. Mm. And maybe I just don't know or notice. But with MetaQuest 3 getting a, a, a new, uh, or MetaQuest 3 being announced recently and yeah. then seeing kind of the enthusiasm, I'm surprised it's not happening. Um, but but I'm not disappointed by anything we saw. I don't misunderstand. So I, I think it's, I think you're not wrong, um, but I still feel like VR given how much of a niche it is for people for first off for people who can even use it uh that and mobile feel like two kind of subsects of community when it comes to gamers that Mm. don't that you can't like regular gamers can go and play those but those don't integrate at all to standard like games that that you would play on console and as a result of that it's always kind of like they're siloed in their own little departments. So there's, it's good to see support for those. Like we saw Assassin's Creed, what was it like Jade is mm-hmm. their mobile game. So they're, they're playing in those, in those realms, but they're not, they're not going to be able to translate over to like Steam or Xbox or, or PlayStation and stuff. So I think that's why we don't see a whole lot of that. The, the nice thing about this Ubisoft Ford was the lack of, nft talk or blockchain bs Mm -hmm. like they're 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 just showing you games that are games they're not trying to sell you on uh items that are going to transfer between games that are uh, locked on the blockchain that you can then have a resale value like i don't care about that i want a video game with a story tell me that right agreed no you're making good points um i i feel like nfts are quietly just fading away but i feel like they're going to get repurposed you know um, yeah but so it goes i i do want to talk a little bit so we, ubisoft is doing uh quite a bit in terms of like bringing me games that i want and we saw a lot of that across the xbox board too but but i was enthusiastic about ubisoft as far as like star wars and whatnot however um uh, kind of a nugget that came out in the past week was that people can fly the people who are making yeah. or who made 
Gears of War Judgment, who made Bullet Storm, who made Outriders, three games that I like um, at varying levels, but I liked Bullet Storm when it first came out. Didn't hold up, I didn't think. Uh, Gears Judgment, a good game, uh, underrated amongst Gears fans, I think. Uh, and Outriders, which was a blast. We played a bit of that in game. It's still in Game Pass. You guys should all play that. Um, fun games, good studio. They are now making a mystery project for Xbox with a budget of uh, around fifty million dollars, which in the in the gaming space is not that much um, for a triple A title, but it's a lot for an indie title. And like some people were providing context for what that would mean. That doesn't touch like a modern Gears of War budget. Um, but control was made at around forty million dollars, roughly, right? Give yeah. or take, and and so people are trying to to get a, a feel for this one. Uh, one fake insider was saying that this is a gear, the Gears remaster or Gears spinoff. Jez Corden trying to debunk that. People going back and forth. Um, it's called Project Maverick. That's the code name. I think in the wake of ABK, which looks to be falling apart, Ellery gave us a good link for that. Um, further down in our show notes but in the wake of abk kind of falling away and the benefit that we're seeing now finally of the bethesda acquisition i like xbox building some second party relationships maybe towerborn is one of those uh with gosh thunder lotus that's not right yeah um, thunder lotus is the is one that's lotus. making 33 immortals that's 33 immortals okay thank you um but the idea of second party relationships something that xbox has not done well with uh, during the Xbox One generation, I like this. I like people can fly and I like them working with Xbox here. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll I definitely don't think it's going to be uh, like an, another Gears game. If it is, it'll be another like guide in the way that uh, Judgment was. But I don't think Judgment is going to like it's not going to be another Judgment. That doesn't even make sense in the, in the timeline of the history. Right. Um, so I I would be interested to see what they do. Maverick to me is is an interesting code name for this just because of the nature of Maverick like it seems like um if it were a Gears game I could see Maverick being a protagonist who's broken away from the cogs and is doing their own thing mm -hmm. and that story like I could see like that being something yeah but given their history with with what they build the type of games that they make it would be weird for them to make like a single player only game. Like they seem really tied to wanting to make games that are that are co-op. Mm -hmm. So I, I I don't know like like would I don't know where that would lead, but it'll be interesting. Um, I I thought I write I thought Outriders was was pretty heavy metal when it comes to to video games. Mm -hmm. I think that they definitely needed more polish on that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there were definitely some smart hooks in there that I think a lot of companies could learn from as far as um making a making a games as a service that respects the difficulty scaling that is 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 designed there mm -hmm. uh i think i saw an article that came out recently where someone had mentioned that uh people can fly still has not made a profit on outriders which kind of makes makes me wonder if like that's why they decided to make this deal with with Microsoft because they didn't secure the funding from Outriders to be able to make their next project. Mm -hmm. So they pitched being able to do something for Microsoft as a result. Yeah, I'm a little salty about reading that because people because people can fly did a good job with Outriders. They supported it well. It's it's got an expansion. It's well worth your time, by the way, listeners. It's in Game Pass. Well worth your time. Um, but not having guaranteed profit kind of is a bummer. And Square Enix, man. It, it really pissed me off lately. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. It's like, yeah. what are you doing? Square um, Enix does a bad job of managing their their uh, Western studios, and, yeah. and it's it's clear that the that there's talent there. They just don't understand. I don't believe they understand what the expectation should be for games. They have such high expectations, and as a result of that, everything that gets put out is a failure to them. Right, uh, unless it has the word "final" and some other word next to it. And then a number. Uh, you're you're living in a fantasy. I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> so it goes. But I, I do hope that this we I hope we find out what this project is sooner rather than later. I hope it's a smaller project, two three year development cycle, not five years, which is what some are. And given the budget, that might be the case. Yeah. Um, heck, maybe it is a maybe it is like a a collection compilation remaster. Whatever it is, I hope people can fly and Xbox build continue building a relationship. I yeah. want 
want, want second party relationships. Nintendo does a great job with that. Uh, they do. PlayStation <laughs> is okay at it. Xbox is not good at it. So, so and Nintendo is doing a really good job at, at having second party studios do really, really good work and then just completely ignoring them afterwards. Yep. Taking all the credit. Yeah, all the credit. <laughs> and then not showing up to the uh, Game Awards to accept their, their award for it. Man, I will never, never understand some Xbox, not, pardon me, some Nintendo fans, the defense that they throw out. It just confuses it's, me. I'm not knocking it. I'm confused by it. I just miss the Reggie days. Reggie was a people yeah. person and uh, it shows. Um, yeah. I miss him. Big time. Big time. That Mario movie, man. So good, though. Oh, God, that's um, so good. I can't wait. Hey, pause from Xbox news for a second. Did you get your gorgeous, and I'm holding it up now for, for listeners, uh, oh. Starfield controller? Did you get this bad boy? You mean this oh, thing? Oh, that this thing. thing. Gosh, oh, yeah. this thing is pretty, right? It feels good. It this feels is a, this good. Is a good. This is a good. Okay, so for those of you that are not sure what's going on, Starfield announced the, uh, the, the, the widely leaked um, controller and headset. Uh, they also announced the collector's edition, which is a, a smart watch uh, that is beautiful. I actually kind of want that, but there's no way in hell I can afford it. Mm -hmm. So same. I it, and it sucks, too, because I was like, oh, that's so cool. It's such a good idea. And I love the case for it. But the Xbox um, Starfield controller, it has a very retro 80s vibe to it, mm -hmm. but that's not what sells it for me. Uh, the fact that it's got all the cool little like decals and stuff on the front that tell you what the controls are going to be for the game itself is really cool. The fact that this, there's two things. The fact that this thing has rubberized grips on mm -hmm. the back. Big time. And it has clear triggers. This, it, this should be the standard. Like I, I was grabbing one of the old uh, or one of the, the, the normal Series X uh, controllers that comes in the box and the grips are not there. They're just plastic. There's a little mm -hmm. texture, but they're not, they're not like a rubberized grip. The rubberized grip on this is like from the elite. Mm -hmm. They need to make this the standard because this is the, this is the most elite I've ever had or held, uh, that isn't technically an elite controller and it feels fantastic. It does. Uh, clearly some good money put into that one. I, I should take back. I said, I couldn't afford the, the, starfield collector's edition i i could afford one collector's edition this holiday and i opted <laughs> for spider-man 2 i managed to get it now it's funny oh funny that i should mention spider-man 2 logan because i found another mm -hmm. spider-man collectible you see this that this looks is, like spider-man 2 it's spider-man 2 for xbox uh the mm -hmm. amazing spider-man 2 on xbox one this is the third time i bought this game uh because the others were defective it's like super oh, rare no. you can't get it digital and it made me lament so badly um as much as i friggin love spider-man on playstation it mm -hmm. makes me lament that those 360 era games the Beanox activision ones mm. are like unavailable right now i want i want those to come out of uh the vault of of licensing deals and such because there's a lot of fun there a lot of superhero games are like that yeah but, uh, now I, I'm the proud owner of Spider-Man on Xbox one, which is very rare. Um, yeah. thank you, eBay and my <laughs> wife. Um, it's funny too, because I was, uh, I was, I was looking at, I just completely lost track of where, where I was going with this. Um, but yeah, no Spider-Man two fantastic. Oh, I remember where I was going. Um, we just saw, and I don't know if we want to talk about it, like, cause I saw that there were some notes about, uh, Matt Booty's comments um, on Redfall, but there was also some comments that he made about how Xbox Studios uh, are now no longer working for games that are going to be released on Xbox One unless they are previously released, like Minecraft was the example. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll chip in and throw in uh, Sea of Thieves in there as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, but it is it is interesting commentary to find out that all of the Xbox Studios are now working solely on building games for the current generation that is now what three years in almost three years old at this point i think november will be the third third year mm -hmm. yeah i uh 
I was I noticed that too. So amidst the Redfall update, um, which not not the sixty per, frames per second update, but I jumped in by the way. It definitely improved AI. Definitely improved enemy in combat. The visuals look better. Um, Redfall's update definitely a step in the right direction. But Matt Booty did comment on a number of things. He talked about development cycles for uh, AAA games. They're they're five years and up now versus what was used to be three years. And yeah. that Xbox Game Studios, to your point, and what you said um, that I want to reiterate is they're no longer making Xbox One games. Yep. Good. Uh, very glad about that, actually. I think it's been too... Uh, they should have abandoned it sooner, I think. Um, but I think the blended generation plus COVID elongated that timeline. Who? So that's that's kind of the the <laughs> issue with, with that one. I don't think they'd plan to do it for three years. It seems weird, like they've they've had the dev kits available for some time, and and it's such an interesting idea to me that in the law in the lead up to um in the lead up to a new generation, they they don't have all studios looking to try and shift development uh, for brand new projects that are maybe like a year or two before the the console launch. Start working on those to have a really strong like series S and series X launch. Like I know that they're really good about cross gen support and stuff and having smart delivery. It's, it's a fantastic uh, a way to be able to purchase content and know that it will just work. Um, but it feels weird that three years into the, into the uh, new generation cycle, they're just now making sure that all the studios are shifted over to working on solely Xbox Series S and X games, especially amid the the commentary from Phil Spencer saying that they do not see a need for a mid-gen refresh. And it's like, well, yeah, you guys haven't even really kicked yeah. off <laughs> studios working on this generation. <laughs> like the hardware's been out. It's already getting dated and, and we haven't even reached full penetration uh, to to be able to get studios to working on just that hardware alone mm -hmm. like we usually see at the end of a of a of a console cycle like the best possible games made for that system because everyone is so used to working on that hardware Remember they halo know the 4? tricks the yeah. visuals of halo 4 you That's see it all the time happened on a 360 the last yeah. of us on ps3 Man. yeah stuff like that so the fact that they it feels so late in the game three years into the into the year of the of the thing you know for for a console that will most likely be or most likely given the the history of like the xbox one and the xbox one x a five year cycle for mm -hmm. mid-gen refreshes a 10-year cycle for the generation i'm just i i'm flabbergasted by that and it, yeah. and it makes and the comment that matt had said about game cycles being a five-year cycle and upwards and then seeing like Corey barlog on twitter quote he tweet or quote tweet that and then say like it's it's that but it's going to get even worse as budgets and stuff go up it's like mm -hmm. you're looking at at close to like an eight to a 10-year cycle for a big triple a game and i'm like that's one game a generation <laughs> which which made me think how happy I was that Avowed is now a smaller scale because originally Avowed was going to be Obsidian's Elder Scrolls. That was the yeah. premise, the idea. And what they found in development was our scope is too wide. We need to narrow and we brought it down to an outer world size project. And I'm yeah. all for that because I'm the guy I want many experiences this year. Logan, to me, has been the best year in gaming of my life. And I want any listener to I, I challenge any listener uh, to to drop a comment or counterpoint because a lot of times people will point to 2007, uh, which is a great year in video games. But a lot of people weren't even gamers now; were just born around there, um, which is also wild to think about. But this year alone, uh, you had Age of Empires, Hi-Fi Rush, Dead Space. You had uh, Resident, Resident Evil, Evil. Yeah. Resident Evil Four. Uh, you had let's see. What what else was it? Resident Evil Four. I'm I gotta pull up my list here. Hogwarts Legacy Hogwarts was an Legacy, amazing game. Jedi Survivor, Dead Island Two, Street Fighter Six, Diablo, um, Wo Long was in there. Like this year has been insane, and we have yet to go uh, 
Sonic Origins Plus, which is a class that's a compilation. I won't count that one, but I will count uh, Sonic Superstars, Exo Primal, Immortals of Avium, Sea of Stars, Starfield, the Cyberpunk expansion, Forza Motorsport, Assassin's Creed, Alan Wake, and Avatar. Like that, the breadth of quality this year is absolutely insane. So it, it just boggles my mind um, when I think about the dev cycles there. And I'm all about smaller experiences because despite all these games coming out, I'm like, what's next? What am I going to play after Diablo? And I'm like, what am I talking about? What a privileged position I'm in that I've played Jedi, played Hi-Fi, played Resident Evil, played Dead, Dead Space. Like, yeah, there's so much to play still. Like the next one up, I think, is Immortals of Avium for me. Yeah. So, you know, like. And that's and, and you're you're talking like just Xbox ecosystem. Like we didn't even touch on the fact that Zelda Breath Zelda. or Tears of the Kingdom came out this year. That is yeah. th- that is a huge game. Like that is a, a game that people will be playing for the next eight to ten years. Yeah. And it's a single player game. It's yeah. not a service game. <laughs> Rocksteady. Sorry, I'm sure Yeah, no kidding, about. right? Oh my god. Rock Hard being State. a DC fan these days, man. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh I'm kind of glad that uh and maybe you can back me up on this. I'm glad that I I I, I was glad to see that Suicide Squad get pushed out to 2024 because there's gotta be something in there and let them have the time. <laughs> Cancel it. Cancel it and make it a Superman game where you're flying around Metropolis stopping stopping people. Superman's um, boring. You're boring. Uh <sighs> You know, it's funny about that blended generation thing. <laughs> Some of the best looking games from this blended generation for Xbox, Halo Infinite, Sea of Thieves, Grounded, mm-hmm. uh, Forza Horizon were blended. But like yeah. they look great still, you know? Yeah, they, they, were, they were made better by the the hardware. And and it's it's insane to think like, ah, you know, well, uh, Xbox One generation was the worst generation. It's like, yeah, but we still got some really good go- content out of there. It for it being a bad generation and they lost badly in terms of sales numbers and such, we yeah. got so much good stuff out of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's your bad generation, like with all due respect, like the GameCube uh and the Wii U whoa, 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 didn't hey, sell hmm, listen, hmm. listen to my point. Okay. Um didn't hmm. sell well at all. Both of those oh. were travesties for Nintendo. Dude, man, some of those they got some incredible games. Some of my favorite okay. games all are right, GameCube yeah. games. All right. right? All right. Yeah. Um, no, GameCube was one of my favorite consoles. It was same. legit like one of my favorite consoles. Hundred dollar system, hundred dollar system. It started out at one hundred fifty dollars. You could buy that console for a hundred dollars. You could pick up th- three more Wave Birds for like forty bucks each. Mm-hmm. You could have one sixty dollar game that was Smash Brothers, and you were set for life. All the Rogue Squadrons, I save one. Uh, Star Fox was good on that. Was that Star Fox Assault? No, there there was a Star Fox game on there. Um, you were nuts, but like Super Mario Super Strikers was was one of my favorite games. There, uh, loved Mario. Like they just, oh god, they took care of us. Zelda was on there. Like, man, GameCube was special, but like, didn't sell at all. Metroid no. Prime's, oh god, uh, it, it, it's such a good idea. It, we, we're we're going into Nintendo world for some reason, and 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 I can see where the nostalgia hits because yeah, the GameCube was fantastic, but yeah, mm-hmm. Xbox One had. Some uh, fantastic games. We got Gears 5. We got Sea of Thieves. We got um, the, uh, I can't think of the name. Anyway, uh, there, there were so many opportunities for the Xbox One to win. And I think it always came back to the idea that if they had had the mentality of what the Xbox Series or the Xbox One X was at the launch of the system with a very powerful piece of hardware and proper focus on games, they would be in a good position. That's where Xbox series is now. And I'm excited to see like, we, I feel like we're turning the corner. If that makes sense. I feel like we've, we've heard the promises. We've seen the, the CG trailers, the last, I think three showcases from Xbox have all been stellar. And the last two in particular have done really good jobs of setting expectations and managing a majority of those. Yep. So I think I think we're rounding that corner. I think uh, Starfield is going to move some units for sure. And what I think people are forgetting, because like I'm looking at Starfield and I'm like, oh, I'm a little overwhelmed. I'm a little nervous. Right. But that's a game that you pick up and you don't finish Starfield. Right. Yeah. That is an ongoing game. Like you'll play it 
and you'll put it down for six months and you'll go back to it and you'll go back to it. And like, that's how that's meant to be played. Similar to Diablo in some ways. Like, I'm sure we're going to burn out of Diablo at some point. Our group is and yeah. take a break and go play something else and then come back. Like, for me, I'm going to get Starfield, play it for a bit. But then it's, Star- it's Spider-Man and Alan Wake time. And when I'm done with those two, the patches will be out. Cyberpunk will be in there, right? The patches will come out and then I'll go back to Starfield. And like, that's the joy of that kind of game. And I think that's going to be a big Xbox seller um, in a way. And what is it? It's single player open world. Yeah. It's also big budget. Like that's going to be the, the balance. Like for every Starfield, once a generation Starfield, you know, I hope we get the avows and avowed two. I want Clockwork Revolution. I want Fable. Like I want them to to narrow the scopes on some and keep the the scope wide on others. Yeah, I think Starfield will be the perfect game for quick resume. That oh, is yeah. that is a if, game it, where you should pin quick resume for Starfield, mm-hmm. seeing as how it's single player and everything in that world is like logged and held onto. Like stuff is like just there for good. Mm-hmm. That's one of those ones like I think people should really consider like giving up one of their quick resume slots for Starfield when that comes out, because I think that's one of those ones where you're going to want to drop in and drop out quickly. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they put the controls on the controller make yep. it so much easier for you to be like, well, what, do, what is hold on? What is it? What is the throttle? Oh, scan is this. OK, I'm good. Then you're set. <laughs> like they've made it simple for you to be able to drop in and drop out. Yeah. Uh, let's transition over to the, this is an interesting one. I don't know. Uh, this, this means something, what it means, I think is up for debate. Now, uh, the streaming numbers for Xbox have, have come out. Now this is a website that I'm not used to. Um, so take it, take that, just know that as an audience member, this is not something I'm overly familiar with, but Clint shared this with me. Um, and I saw Larry Herb retweet and quote tweet this one as well. Yeah. Streamcharts.com notes that Xbox was the most popular of the gaming showcases. Caveat, uh, it doesn't count the PlayStation showcase because yeah, of the time. Yeah, it was time. just June. Yeah, for, for June. Thank you. Um, 2.3 million concurrent viewers watched the Xbox showcase, which is wild and appropriate, I think, given that we saw uh, things like, what do we see in there? We saw uh, Star Wars was in there. We saw new... Uh, titles from from Xbox in terms of IP that was there. We saw Fable, which was long awaited. A lot of people really excited, but 2.3 million peak viewers. Pretty darn impressive, all things considered. Uh, That does factor in the Starfield Direct. Uh, Summer Game Fest for context, Logan, uh, just a couple days prior, that peaked at just a little over 2 million concurrent viewers. Ubisoft Ford at 1.1 million viewers. Capcom and the rest below uh, 1 million viewers, uh, and then just Xbox fans, the showcase extended was, uh, 200,000, a little over 200,000 for concurrent, concurrent viewers. Now, what this means to me, Logan, is that people are excited about Xbox again. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean they're buying, doesn't mean anything else, but it means they're interested and, and excited in a way they haven't been. Would you agree or am I off base? I, so I want to bring up the, the PlayStation showcase numbers. Cause I think yep. that is a, a good way to kind of gauge like who's watching it. Um, cause the PlayStation showcase hit 2.6 million peak viewers. Uh, thanks in large part to the Spider-Man two review, uh, mm-hmm. or, or like kind of show little vignette that they put out. Um, and it had been a very long time since, uh, Sony had had a, a showcase Mm-hmm. Um, now they've had like their, their PS, uh, uh, like what do they call them? Directs. Yeah. I think it's directs now. Uh, state of, they've play, had, state of play, state of play, state of play. That's it. That's right. Cause Nintendo's direct. Um, yeah. so they've had their state of plays in the past, but they haven't had like a showcase. So everyone kind of showed up expecting, you know, a, a 2020 showcase from them, you know, like something huge and bombastic. And I think that the, I think that a lot of fans were let down by that. But the fact that 2.6 million showed up and then 2.3 million showed up for Xbox says that there is a a pretty good group of people that are also fans, but also media uh, who are all kind of looking at at the same showcases like it. It didn't seem like it really varied uh, between 
size of of like viewers between the two main consoles like three three hundred thousand is not huge when we're talking yeah. about millions so i think it was telling to me that the same people who watched the playstation one were the same people who watched the xbox one same people you think it's the same people i do i do because i think a lot of it was people covering it but i think a lot of it were people who are enthusiasts uh, in general Mm -hmm. enough to keep up with that kind of stuff who would have both consoles interesting i don't know that i feel confident saying it's the same people but i agree that it's the same interest level yeah i have i have no no like data to suggest that it's it's purely on my speculation on what i think Mm -hmm. it is but my my hunch is given that these are the same people watching both showcases like we are we are already anecdotal evidence to that Mm -hmm. so I that's just kind of where my mindset falls in. Um, I would be very impressed if it was like a majority of only PlayStation fans tuned in for the Sony one and only Xbox fans turned out for the Xbox one because it shows that there's a a level of engagement uh, separate to the ecosystems that is is on par with each other, even if the sales don't weigh out as far as like who's buying what console, uh, there are still a, a general interest that is on par uh, between these two two ecosystems and stuff the summer games fest i think is the interesting one that that one still actually pulled in two million and i was is it weird to me to to still kind of snub jeff for not having anything cyberpunk and then seeing something cyberpunk at at xbox after he had said that they were going to have something at cyber uh, at summer games fest that was cyberpunk i don't remember him saying that did he say that I oh now you're now you're gonna ask me to source this, but um, I'm pretty dis- sure on Twitter I was d- disappointed by Summer Game Fest. Um, hindsight being what it is, that was a really weak show for me. Um, and I say a weak show like contextually, right? Like I really liked PlayStation and Xbox's showcases. I really liked Ubisoft Ford. I thought Summer Game Fest really um, fell short for me, and it felt to me like Keeley was overextended. Um, it also makes sense to me that that Xbox didn't give him anything because they wanted this moment for themselves as they needed. Um, Mm -hmm. And while you're looking that up, I want to note kind of while we're looking at charts and and numbers and stuff, Phil Spencer had said that they had had fixed their supply shortage on Series X. And I saw uh, several articles coming out essentially saying that, yeah, Series X is selling a lot better. Uh, Mm. because they have units to sell, which is nice to see, you know, in terms of like people watching the showcases, buying boxes, getting into the ecosystem. It feels good to see the excitement around. it. I think I've said this on previous shows or or shows that we guessed it on. It feels good to see people excited about Xbox again. Um, Yeah. All the while there, you didn't see Master Chief. You didn't see Halo season four. You didn't see Gears. I'm glad you're bringing Um, this up. That's important. You know, this was people. People are stale. Those who are interested in Halo and Gears, I think, are interested in Halo and Gears. And they already exist, but they're not bringing in new people. But this new stuff is is rallying and interest. And I'm 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 really appreciative of that. I like that. Um, And I'm the guy with the custom Gears console. I think I had it on our last show in my background just to prove Um, I'm the guy that, you know, has the all the Halo statues and controllers like I love those pillar Xbox franchises, but it was nice to see new pillars pillars being built and received. Well, proof is in the pudding. Once we play it, we'll know, but, uh, I, I, it feels good to see people genuinely happy. They're watching, uh, showcases, they're buying boxes, they're checking out the games. Um, that feels good. Yeah. It feels good. It's nice that we can be excited about an Xbox showcase that did not have gears and halo. The fact that it, that is possible shows a lot of strength in the in in what we saw, like yep. having people come away from it. And and I did see some folks that are like, oh, it's weird that they didn't have the Halo season four trailer in there. They should have had that in there. They should have had a, an update on the Phoenix Mar- or the Marcus Phoenix collection in there and stuff. And it's like, yeah, no, I disagree. I, I, I'm good without it. I no. I mean. I'm I'm good that they that they didn't bother with those. There were obviously like certain titles that we got updates for that didn't hit for me, but because they are f- staples in Game Pass, it makes sense for them to bring those up. Like Sea of Thieves, Elder Scrolls, um, 
uh, uh, Fallout 76. Those are like the three that you can count on that they will show you the updates to what those games are going to be if there's mm-hmm. if there's a big enough content, like obviously Atlantic City, uh, Monkey Island, and um, Necrom, I think is the name of the Elder Scrolls one. Like mm-hmm. those are going to be big updates for those games. And those games as a service have lots of returning uh, players every month like the monthly after active users for those is important so that makes sense when halo gets to that point then you can put that stuff in there until then y'all ain't playing halo so mm-hmm. that's yeah. why you're not seeing that content in there yep simple as that and and so it goes and i go back to halo infinite was a great game it just didn't oh, yeah. have the legs for the multiplayer that that people expected it to. But like anyone that hasn't played Halo Infinite, go play it. It's good, fun, yeah. great campaign. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, fun multiplayer if that's what you're into. But if not, move on. Um, I was a, a guest on Mr. Boomstick show where we wa- live reacted to the sh- Xbox Showcase Extended, and I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention it. Um, I, that really fell flat for me. But it also it was the Showcase Extended. Uh, I liked in the showcase extended that they did some spotlighting on some indie games. I really enjoyed that. Uh, that's good. You need to do that. I'm also glad that those indie games weren't at the showcase proper, not because I'm anti indie, but I think they would have been drowned out. Um, that's true. That, that was my worry. I was listening to, to Kyle Stevenson, who you mentioned at the top of the show, uh, chat with Joseph Moran about showcases and indie titles and stuff and my fear with indies at some of those big showcases is they get drowned out so at the showcase proper phil spencer played immortals of avium not more i'm three 33 immortals yeah um was that the showcase pro- no at the showcase extended gave some spotlight to that game uh we saw a good sizzle reel which you'll have seen by now if you've been watching the youtube show i probably rolled that a few times at the top of the show I like when indie games are at the showcase extended because it doesn't it means they're not drowned out and Xbox is still building relationships, um, which is important. So I, showcase extended is to me a good background. Put it on in the background while you're doing something uh, mm-hmm. and look up when you're interested, because like yeah. I don't need to see uh, Paris Lily go check out the physical uh, helicopter from Dune, but it's cool, <laughs> right? Like that's great for a showcase extended, not in a. Yeah, E3 presentation. So I'm glad that Showcase Extended exists. That that's the exact um, ding that Xbox received in uh, 2022 in the August Showcase when they had like a whole thing about trebuchets in Age of Empires, and everyone was like, "What is this? This is not what we're here for. We're glad that you all found a trebuchet, but no one cares. It's a weird catapult." like stop and that's that's why i'm glad that like look if you're going to do a showcase you have eyes for people that don't normally dip into this kind of like ecosystem or this kind of like thing you know they're coming for the showcase you want to showcase the best and the stuff that you know is important to your monthly active users for game pass And that is exactly what they did. Everything else is like Nintendo treehouse levels of, of like quality. Like you're going to have the devs, you're going to have some spokespeople. They're all going to sit down. You're going to have some nice chats. You're going to dive into stuff that you couldn't in a showcase because you only have so much time to impress or make impressions. So then if you want the context or the details, that's a great place for that. Keep that there because it's important. It's good to have. It, it helps breathe a lot of uh, uh, life into titles that you didn't get a chance to really dive into. Mm-hmm. And if you're if, if you're upset that they that they quote unquote snubbed it, then I respect that. But it's not going to hit for the people that are coming that don't normally follow this type of content. And that's yeah. that to me is why Xbox is kind of focusing more on those people as opposed to us who are more invested in like every title that's going to be announced. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, let's see. Kind of, a, I say this is a small topic. It's not a small topic, but it's small for us. Um, Ellery from our discord uh, rightfully put into our suggested topics. Uh, basically the, the ABK deal, a federal court in California issued a temporary restraining order that was requested by the FTC that effectively blocks the deal. Um, I am not a lawyer. Don't want to pretend to be. I don't know the details. I, I've read. I read. So, I pulled this from a couple articles. Yeah. I just want to say, it, it looks more and more like this isn't happening. 
but I don't care. No, <laughs> especially the, after that showcase. So, so this is kind of the make or break deal right now with the FTC. Like they filed for uh, a, a preliminary injunction, which would stop the deal if it goes mm -hmm. through. If a federal court decides to file for or decides to side on the FTC and and go through with the preliminary injunction, then that stops the deal cold. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of like them doing what Microsoft wanted them to do. They wanted to get to court faster because otherwise it's going to cost millions of dollars to 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 pay for um, the deal going beyond the July date. Mm -hmm. So this is going to make that decision a lot faster. Xbox mm. feels like they have a strong enough case to go to court for it, for the FTC. The FTC's case is not very strong. They really don't have a backbone to really kind of like uh, uh, say like, okay, well, this is going to be bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also going to make the CMA look like complete fools if the federal courts decide to let this go through. Mm -hmm. Because if, 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 the, if the federal court decides to let this go through, then Xbox will close the deal and deal with Europe later. Well, within the time for Europe said it was good. Not it was Europe. The CMA um, that said it was the CMA. UK. They'll deal with the yeah. CMA because the CMA just let uh, T-Mobile deal go through. I saw that. Which which is like complete. Like there's a whole there's there's like a whole like red flags. They're like oh crap, we didn't let the Microsoft deal go through. We're getting a lot of shade. Now we have to let something go through to say that we're uh, you know allowing for business to expand in the UK. It's like you sons of freaking get out of here, you stupid idiots. Mm -hmm. what are you doing like you let one go through but you're not letting go of the other one because of a, of a market that doesn't exist yet or, or or isn't like a mainstay it's like oh my god get, get over yourself let this thing happen i think that microsoft still has a, a a horse in the race i still or a dog in the race i think it doesn't matter dog in the Whatever. race yeah. um i think that microsoft still has a chance for this to work out a lot of it will come down to the federal judge looking at the facts and not the proposals of what could happen no there's mm -hmm. no what ifs to a judge like he doesn't care he's just looking at what is what is current market dictate and then base it off of that and so i don't think the preliminary injunction is going to go through i i think microsoft will close the deal and they will they will then deal with the cma post mm -hmm. and i think it'll be fine um but it is definitely like it's it's a gamble they're rolling the dice on this and that mm -hmm. is that is spooky when it comes to seventy billion dollars. It so I, I go back to Luke Lore does not care if Activision is bought by Xbox or not, but I like the disruption, and I like that we had a great showcase despite this. Right, like even yeah. without Activision Blizzard, we got a good, good roadmap of Xbox. I like that, and I maintain I don't need any Act Activision things to be exclusive. I just want Toys for Bob to make make some cool platformers again. They've been yeah. they've been dissolved. They have been merged into Diablo 4. If you want boy Toys for Bob content, Wait, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to go into Diablo and find Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> was it worth it? <laughs> and kill them. Know. Yes. Yes, yes it, it was. was and Diablo's so, so worth it. It's so good. <laughs> so Get good. out of here with that. <laughs> but I still want I still want them back. No, I know, but but the beauty of that's the beauty of of games industry. Like there mm -hmm. there are no everyone's a free agent. People will quit, they will make a new studio and they will make whatever they want with the mm -hmm. IP that they can or or their brand new IP. It's how we get new new stuff like ukulele. It's it is the new banjo. If y'all call in for banjo kazooie get out of get your head out of the sand and go play more uh, ukulele or, or or figure out why uh playtronics is not making another uh ukulele in in just uh, you know that's where you're gonna find that content or go go hit up the uh the the developers for a new super lucky's tale like figure out why they aren't making another super lucky's tale if they if they aren't i could tell you that well i interviewed paul bettner and he's off in web3 world making nft games but not predatory oh yeah that's ones. right that's yeah, right. I think we talk about, it. but like I love New yeah. Super Lucky's Tale. Play that game, guys. It's good. Yeah, please. Um, uh, real quick, guys, uh, before we get to listener questions, which we only have a few this week, uh, I think everybody's catching their breath. I am interviewing the Planet of Lana team. Uh, this, so by the time you're listening to this, I will have interviewed them. It's my my call time is Monday, six a.m. my time. Uh, that's what I will be getting up real early on vacation to talk to the Planet of Lana creative director, which is really exciting. Um, the game's really good. This was a listener requested interview, which I'm excited about. I put a call out. Hey, who do you guys want me to talk to? 
uh, several people, including Ellery and, and Nerd Propellant, are like, yo, Planet of Lana. Yeah. I finally be able to make that happen. I've got a few others in the works. One of them is really big. Uh, so knock on wood, if that goes through, fantastic. If it doesn't, so it goes. Um, but now that developers are freeing up again post showcase, I should be able to get back on track with that one. I also did a uh, creator talk with Neo GameSpark, which is fantastic. If you guys haven't checked that one out, that's up there for tier two and three patrons. Um, definitely some stuff happening there, but our schedule was disrupted by the showcases. So I wanted to address that um, yeah. if, if there was anybody that was wondering. So I know nobody would be upset, but if anybody was wondering. Uh, Let's see here, Logan. We've got a couple questions here. Uh, Todd Oxtra and Edward Varnell writing in as they so often do. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, you gentlemen. Both amazing and fantastic. Firm handshakes. Big time. Big time. Uh, first one goes to Todd Oxtra. He says, Xbox looks to have a strong back half of 2023. Of the 2024 games announced, when do you think those will release? Uh, of course, the 2023, we're going to get Forza Motorsport and Starfield. Uh, those are two fantastic, fantastically uh, large games for their audience. I think it's a great way for Xbox to end. I think we've debated if we would get a third game in there, but it really, in, in my yeah. mind, Logan, it makes sense to push anything to 2024 now. Let these two games have their moment amidst a busy third-party uh, release. Um, I know what I think the schedule is going to be as far as 2024 games, but you share yours first. Okay, so I I'm kind of scrubbing through what we got in the showcase because I was trying to I always have trouble remembering what what was announced, but um, I think we're gonna get Hellblade two uh, first half of 2024. Agree. I think we will get Avowed late 2024. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are gonna be the two main ones. Uh, I think Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 will probably be a good uh like late spring kind of update like maybe no maybe not late but like mid spring release i think that'll be like a good uh, uh may title uh for folks um i'm trying to think of what else they could Do really you think clockwork revolution lands in 2024 no i don't okay. no not not in the slightest they were so really thinking... smart about like if it had, if it was going to have a year, they put a year. If it, if mm -hmm. it was going to be beyond, we saw no twenty twenty five. So if there wasn't a year, it's it's not coming twenty twenty four. So I'm thinking Hellblade is in Q one or Q two. Avowed is in Q two or Q. Uh, actually, I could see Avowed landing anywhere summer to to fall. Flight Sim is a good bet. Obviously, it's Flight, Flight Sim twenty twenty four. Um, but I think that's a summer game. So maybe you put Avowed in as your holiday, mm. uh, and then you've got Towerborn. So that would mean Hellblade, Avowed, Towerborn, and Flight Sim would be your four games if you're trying to stick the pillar stuff. Um, I think Fable is an early 2025 game. Um, like I said first half, I should say. And I think it's important that as, as a company, Microsoft and, and in general game, to, game publishers realize that holiday is not the goal. Um, it doesn't need to be the goal. Uh, yeah. You can still sell very well anytime now at this point. Um, I love that Avatar is coming in December. I think it's great. Um, yeah. We don't have anything big for November. Strangely, I thought we did. I, I thought we had a November stuff. Uh, uh, if I pull up our Persona Five's Tactics is November. Okay, um, that's not. A, we have nothing on our notes list uh the latest one we have is alan wake 2 on october 17th and then it jumps to pandora um which is on okay. december 7th so maybe i'm wrong but like my, my point is there's a lot coming out at the end of this year i like yeah. that some of that stuff can just be q1 because like honestly if hellblade was this year it's too much man starfield cyberpunk forza assassin's creed mirage alan wake avatar like how long you get hellblade in there like i'm okay with it so my, my thought is yeah. that Hellblade, Towerborn, Avowed, and Flight Sim are your 2024 games for first party. Um, and then you have Fable, Clockwork Revolution, and probably one of the ones we already know about, uh, like Indie or, or Perfect Dark or something, maybe late 2025. We'll see. We'll see. And like, who knows? Development's hard. Timelines are long, and I'm, and I'm cool yeah. with it. But if that's Xbox's show, uh, pillar titles. Yeah. For 2024, Hellblade and Avowed speak to me. 
Towerborn is a game I was going to play regardless, but it doesn't to me, to me be a pillar title. Flight Sim, not interested in, but but great. It's important. It, it's important. Is there something else in there? Yes. There is another, to me, a 2024 game that we don't know about that's happening there. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and we'll see. And then you got to think the ongoing content. Do you have a Halo Battle Royale? Do you have a Sea of Thieves expansion? Do you have Grounded? You're going to have all those live service. Like, sometimes we're a little too spoiled in what we expect. Not Todd, yeah. but I mean in general as gamers. No, yeah, I agree. I think you're definitely going to have like South of Midnight, Fable. Um, those are going to be your 2025 games. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely think I'm, I'm actually kind of with you on the Microsoft in summer thing. I think that makes sense because that's kind of where we got the last Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that like feels him. about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. I would, I could definitely see, I, I feel like Hellblade's going to be Q1. Like I feel like they're, they're getting real close to getting that out. Yeah. It has a great and January pickup too. I wouldn't even, I would, uh, well, we don't know. Cause this year was like all February and, and the year before that was all February as well right. too. So I, I wouldn't be opposed to a January uh but I, I i have a feeling it'll be like later in q1 than earlier yeah. if that makes I sense just, i love the january window because everybody's got their boxes they've caught their breath from from new years and they've played everything they played at, at christmas time for those people that celebrate and then bam if you have a pillar title like um playstation did a good job but they did the march february march thing with of gt and horizon yeah so, last year time's weird but like that was a great hit so if you bought a playstation then then a few months after you got horizon you got gran turismo i love that idea of yo here's hellblade boom yeah you've explored yeah. game pass here's your next big one here's why you should have game pass i like that yeah yeah i think towerborn will be after that and then i think flight sim and then i think uh avowed after i think avowed will be the uh the fall title I think you got a, a secret game in there. Something not secret, but like you have a small smaller. Time. Yeah. And nobody should be thinking Towerborn is in their triple A category. That's a very clearly scoped game. I hope, you know, I hope nobody's counting on that to be a pillar title. That's an unfair expectation. I think. Yeah. Um, all right. Next question. Last question for the show uh, is coming from Mr. Edward Barnell. And I got to scroll here. Uh, he says, after Digital Foundry stated that 30 frames per second is here to stay, do you think the X, that you think Xbox's next console should not mention frames per second anymore in their marketing if it carries over into that gen two? Um, should we talk about the frames per second? We didn't get a chance to really dive into that, did we? Happy to entertain the conversation. I don't know much about it. Like to me, I play if it's fun or not. So, and I'm not a tech head. So yeah. if you if you want to comment on it, I will gladly listen and, and uh, bow out and, and listen to your expertise because I don't I'm not knowledgeable in that realm. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm thinking because I mean this has been my statement for for a long time. Like I I'm very particular about frame rates. Um, given that now I can actually see the difference with the TV that I have, mm -hmm. I prefer sixty. Um, one twenty is nice. VRR stabilizes a lot of the fluctuation in that. 30 is a little low for what I want in games nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, Breath of the Wild is great. Or not Breath of the Wild. Tears of the Kingdom is great. But it always kind of hurts me a little when I turn and the camera stutters. And I'm like, that's a bummer. That, that kind of, you know, it would be great if that game was so polished that they could just like have it completely locked at 30. With... uh. Starfield coming out and saying that they're that it will perform better than 30, but they wanted the consistency, so they're locking it at 30. That to me it means a lot because I, I would much rather have a, a 30 frames that are locked mm -hmm. than uh something that's gonna dip below that or fluctuate too much between 60 and 30, because that is tends to be more jarring uh than if it were just a few frames off of uh, off of 60. So the fact that that digital foundry is stating that 30 frames per second is here to say is, is not to say that games that systems can't do 60 because, uh, as, as they had said in, in one of their videos, there were consoles in the eighties and nineties that could do 60 locked. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to the developer's intent. 
Like what scope? do they, yeah, scope okay. and intent is, is what they're, what they're trying to, to play around. What do they want to do that they know that frames per second is the thing that will help sacrifice to achieve that goal? And in this case with Starfield, it is persistence with everything that happens in that game. If you drop something on a planet, you jump uh, th three planets later and you do half of the content in there and you come back to that planet, that gun is still going to be sitting there. Now, I don't know if that's something that needs to happen in a game where, it, it, you know, a lot of us understand Vig games have limits. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't necessarily need like the bodies in Diablo four that I murdered to stay there in perpetuity. Right. Because they're going to respawn. And I imagine things in, in Starfield, like as far as I know, I could be wrong. Can't wait to play the game and find out. But if I murder an entire planet of creatures I'm pretty sure that those creatures are going to respawn. There's yeah. not like a finite amount of resources on these planets that you can go and mine. And then when you mine it, it's like, okay, well, pff, that's a worthless planet because I mined everything out of there. Right. I'm pretty sure that stuff's going to respawn. So I don't understand like if that's the case and maybe I'm wrong, that would be really, really interesting to see like the first person that plays through all of Starfield and mines and murders everything mm -hmm. to where it's just a dead bunch of solar systems. But I don't know, man. I don't know that the that was the choice they made. It's the choice we'll have to live with. I will play the game regardless. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not something that I think was necessary. It seems like it's like they talk about like how important the food is and how much time and energy they spend into the food. It's like, how long are you really going to be staring at the food? Yeah, that was kind of my kicker with a bit of it was like, I, I don't care um, mm -hmm. about some of that stuff. I would, in some cases, Luke Lore would rather six. I, in all cases, I would rather sixty frames, right? Yeah. But if I'm spending money, I tr that means I trust the developer enough to give me an experience. And of course, the systems can all do sixty. They can do one twenty, easy, right? Yeah. You play Ori, you play Gears Five on an Xbox One. You can CFEs. play Sea of Thieves at one twenty. Yeah. But scope matters, and they chose their scope to be uh, wider and have that perpetuity, have that persistence, and okay cool yeah. um it's I all want, preference I, I i want to be proven wrong when i sit down and play it and i realize how cool it is that stuff that i did at the beginning of the game tracks mm -hmm. to the very end of the game like right. it would be it would be absolutely insane if i went and i murdered one gang leader one space punk because i'm a curmudgeon old space guy mm -hmm. and everyone's a punk uh, if I killed that one punk on that one planet when I first got into the game and 300 hours later after I've beaten the campaign and built up an empire on some desolate planet next to a gas giant, I sail back and I'm like, I remember the day I killed that space punk. I'm going to go back and kick his bones, mm -hmm. you know, and I go back there and that body is still there. That would be really cool. Yeah. But is that going to happen? Is, is, that the, is that the promise? Right. Yeah, it's a fair question. It's a good question. I I don't have the answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, also, we'll like, wait. to to Edward's true question, like, should they remove that from marketing? Nah, nah, that's a I good. I mean, like, maybe, but like teraflops. Remember teraflops? <laughs> PlayStation and Xbox. We're all talking about teraflops. Stadia was talking about teraflops. You know, frames per se. It's always something, and it's not just Xbox. It's everybody. Um, it's just a matter of preference and what's what's in the zeitgeist at the time. So here's here's an interesting piggyback off of that. I don't remember them ever saying during that Xbox or during that Starfield Direct what the frame rate was going to be. So it came in a and a It did. But that isn't the, I mean, that's like a QA. and a That wouldn't be the, the marketing that's in the YouTube video mm -hmm. post direct. Right. So as far as I as far as I could tell. Mm -hmm. They never they never stated what the FPS was going to be in the marketing material. They mm -hmm. did clarify with the Q&A, which I think, you know, if you're if you're doing a Q&A, you should be available to answer those kind of questions and not right. and not skirt around the issue. Uh, his, his question might be targeted more like, like Redfall did that. They made that mistake. Starfield did not make that mistake, but Redfall did. So maybe that maybe he's thinking kind of en masse. True. Could see maybe. that. I could definitely see that because, yeah, that was something like on the back of the box, 
like kind of information, stuff like that. Um, I think it's important to disclose that information because uh, as much as people say like FPS doesn't matter, it does. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we're spending a lot of money on this hardware. um, Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why people who buy PCs at exorbitantly more money you know, at costs that are two to three times the the amount of of what a console is nowadays to be able to get those high frame rates. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why people are spending that money, and that's because there's an an, an expected value that's that is inherent with that. There's why there was this the I think the sales for like the P uh, the PC version were going to be higher for Starfield. I think for pre orders because they know that the game can do more than thirty frames per second, but the hardware is being locked at it so they want that unlocked frame rate with the pc version Mm -hmm. so that they can experience it with the like they're going to buy the version that's going to allow them to have 60 frames per second because they're spending the money on the hardware as xbox gamers we buy into the the marketing that they have for the console saying that it's going to run games at 4k 60 that it's going to run games that have ray tracing it's going to run games at 120 frames per second it's all going to vary from game to game but i think that we need to figure out why 30 is something that is is the only option like where where can the scope be pulled in to ensure that you aren't having a game that's going to cause people nausea or headaches because the frame rate is so low Mm -hmm. but that's my opinion they don't have to do that. Hey, man, that's your opinion. <laughs> all righty, guys, that is a, a great show. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Logan, uh, I know you you started kind of you teases at the top, but tell me what you got going on. Keel Hall vacations uh, where the people Ooh, uh, su- can support you. I um so yeah I'm gonna be on vacation so Keel Hall's going to be kind of an interesting place because I'm I'm gonna be doing one episode at one of the SOT fests in the UK uh, at the the festival there, uh, the other one is going to be covered by a cohort of mine who's going to be uh, covering for the the Feast of Legends or the Fest of Legends which is the NA version of Sea of Thieves. But if you guys have any questions about the upcoming adventure, uh, the latest patch with Captaincy and the the cost reductions and trinkets there, uh, if if you have any um, questions about why Bone Necro is the best in Diablo 4, uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter at C-A-P-T underscore L-O-G-U-N. You can always look up the Keelhauled podcast uh, through Google, through uh, YouTube, wherever you want to listen, see if you use uh, Spotify, any of that stuff. Um, otherwise, uh, I hang out in my Discord, but as well as the Patreon Discord for XEP is too. Yeah, there you go. Uh, listeners, thank you all so much for supporting XCP by way, by way of whatever podcast platform you are listening to watching on. We appreciate you guys. You can find me on Twitter at insipid ghost. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you guys have a great rest of your week. Take care.